ladies and gentlemen the story of indian philosophy and of the art which helps us on this journey is the story of the constant search for the eternal truth beyond the passing shadows of the ephemeral world the world as we see it visibly around us is termed maya or mithya an illusion we see these illusory forms of the world owing to the limitations of our senses and sensibilities therefore we remain caught in a spell of uh, samsara and we are blinded to the reality which is beyond the reality which is eternal this reality this eternal truth is termed variously in the uh, uh, different schools of indian philosophy it is called nirgun without qualities it is called arupa without forms of the world as we perceive them around us it is believed to be a search for uh, shunyata or the discovery of the uh, emptiness of all the forms around us now this search for the truth obviously requires that we pull away from the uh, chaos the cares and confusions of the material world and look within it requires a space of silence it requires an inward search and through this we hope to discover that which is beyond it all all this is more easily said than done and uh, indian art whose stated purpose it is to help us on this philosophic path tries to help us it creates a realm in which we may be able to concentrate on this uh, journey within and while it does this it still recognizes the leela the play upon our senses of the uh, many fruits and temptations of the world around us so there is a recognition of both this leela of the forms of the world the temptations of the world the happenings of the world and yet at the same time creating a realm in which we can uh, look beyond all this to that which may be lasting that which may be the truth now as we were saying the search is for that which is beyond the forms of the world as we perceive them around us therefore the uh, stupa in uh, ajivika thought in buddhist thought in jaina thought and in uh, uh, hindu thought the linga which is uh, which means the mark or the symbol the symbol of the formless eternal now the purpose of these is described in the vishnu dharmotra where it states that uh, the best way to see the true world is with eyes closed in meditation therefore as you see the stupa is closest to being formless it does not distract us with the forms of the world it does not remind us of our wives our husbands our children it does not remind us of the fruit that grows upon the trees it does not remind us of birds and animals it is practically formless and thereby it helps us as we meditate to create a world where we may be able to look beyond 
all these ephemeral forms that constantly occupy us, that constantly keep, keep our thoughts engaged. And uh, along with the philosophy of uh, Buddhism, the concept of the stupa spread far and wide to all the countries of uh, Asia. Here we see a stupa in Uzbekistan. In fact, uh, Central Asia was a, uh, a great place of Buddhism, a great place of Sanskrit and a great place of Buddhism. And this marvelous stupa in uh, Uzbekistan is of uh, between the first and the third uh, centuries. And such stupas were made right across Central Asia. They were made uh, as far across China to Japan. They were made in the countries to the south, in all the way to Sri Lanka. They were made all over uh, Southeast Asia. In fact, Practically every hilltop in India was uh, capped once with a stupa. And uh, though the Buddhist stupas are uh, better known, what is not often uh, known and not often uh, spoken about is the fact that the Jains had as many stupas as the Buddhists. And uh, here we see uh, a fragment from the uh, railing from the uh, uh, Jain stupa of the uh, first, second century BCE, which was at Kankali Tila, close to uh, Mathura. And uh, there were uh, many such uh, stupas and they are exactly the same in most ways as uh, the Buddhist uh, stupas. And here on this fragment from the uh, stupa railing, we see a depiction of what the uh, uh, Torana and the railing Vedika look like. Now this is a very typical of uh, early stupa railings. You see the same at uh, uh, Amravati in uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh. And uh, you see it here. There is a self-imaging of the monument which is depicted on the monument itself. So here you get an idea of the gateway, the Torana and the Vedika, the railing of this Jaina stupa and how it may have looked. And to both the sides, you see the uh, yakshis, which we will speak uh, more about uh, in the course of this talk. And uh, these uh, are very typical of the gateways of Jaina stupas, Buddhist stupas, and Hindu temples. Here we go back to the 8th to the 10th uh, centuries BCE, a uh, stupa which has been excavated, a vast stupa which has been excavated uh, close to uh, the ancient University of Nalanda in Bihar. And uh, this would have belonged to the uh, Ajivikas of that time. The Ajivikas are known to have had uh, stupas just like the uh, Buddhists and the Jainas. And here we come to the great uh, Borobudur uh, stupa of the 8th, 9th century in uh, Indonesia. And uh, this is a marvelous, very important stupa also because it uh, describes very carefully and in great detail the purpose of the stupa in Buddhist thought. Now there is a most exquisite uh, sculptural relief made around the stupa, which the devotee sees as he 
circumambulates as he goes around the stupa. And uh, at the lowest level of circumambulation, of going around the stupa, is made the kamadhatu, or the life of passions in the world. The devotee then uh, climbs up the steps and goes around again. And there are two levels after that of the karma dhatu, actions in the world and how we can improve our lot through good actions. Then beyond that, as we climb up and go around again, the exquisite relief uh, brings us the uh, rupa dhatu. Rupa, rupa is form. And here we see the concept of uh, enlightenment being given a form. This is the form of uh, Gautama Siddhartha Buddha. And we see the Lalit Vistar. We see the drama of the life of the Buddha and we have the uh, Jataka stories of his uh, previous births. And uh, this is indeed exquisite uh, relief sculpture, which if you have not seen, you must see one day, 8th, ninth century. And then beyond the Rupa Dhatu, we leave the Rupa, the forms, the personification, of the enlightenment behind us and we approach the Kala gateway, the gateway of time. For indeed, we must leave behind time itself and proceed further to what is beyond. And right on the top, right at the top of the ascent is only Arupa, formless, the stupa, itself. And uh, on this uh, Kala gateway that we will, that we pass under, we see above us uh, a Kirti Muk. We see the, uh, we see a, a, a glorious face which is uh, disgorging the forms of the world as we see around us. For indeed, all the forms that we see exist only in time. And we must leave behind all the forms and we must leave behind time itself and try to approach the knowledge of uh, Arupa, the stupa. Now in uh, Hindu thought, we have uh, the uh, linga, the uh, symbol or the mark of the formless eternal. Again, to take us away from uh, the forms of the world around us to that which is lasting. And in the sacred sanctum, in the silence of the sacred sanctum, where we would not be disturbed, in the darkness of the sacred sanctum, where we are away from the, from the calling of the numerous uh, uh, desires and forms of the world around us. There in that darkened interior, we have before us the linga that represents the nirgun, the formless eternal towards which we seek to reach. And uh, here we have the uh, Chidambaram temple, the most sacred uh, Shiva temple of uh, Tamil Nadu. Now in this temple is the most sacred uh, Shiva Linga. In front of the Shiva Linga, our uh, silver curtains. We have to part the silver curtains and look beyond towards the linga. And what do we see? 
we see nothing at all for the temple preserves as the uh, as the priests of the temple uh, retain ancient knowledge enough to tell us the temple contains this the most upanishadic representation of the linga they are very proud of the fact these uh, the priests of the temple that uh, the Chidambaram temple has the most formful presentation of Shiva as Nataraja, the cosmic dancer. And at the same time, it also has the most Upanishadic, the greatest presentation of the uh, Linga as uh, formless, where you see nothing at all. Now, as the devotee approached the, uh, the temple or the stupa, the outer walls presented the forms of the world as we know them and recognize them around us. These are uh, reverentially presented in the outer section of the temple and the stupa. As the devotee comes, and takes his first circumambulation of the temple or the uh, railings around the stupa. He sees the world as he knows it and recognizes it. He sees the world that he wishes to leave behind, that he wishes to go beyond as he will enter and he will uh, attempt the journey of true knowledge. And uh, these uh, forms that are presented here include uh, human beings. They include scenes from our daily life. They include the fun and frolic and everything else that we have around us. In fact, in this uh, representation that you see from the first century BCE, uh, this is from the uh, beautiful uh, Buddhist uh, caves at uh, Kundavne in Maharashtra. Here I must uh, suggest that uh, these are uh, Kundavne caves are lesser known, but uh, surely uh, worthy of uh, <clears throat> a visit if you get the chance. It is uh, uh, on a turn from the uh, highway heading from uh, Mumbai to uh, Pune near uh, Karjat. And uh, I do not know if a road may have been recently made, but uh, till the last time that I went there, it was uh, uh, a little walk through a forest. And then going through the forest, you came upon this beautiful uh, Chaitya, this magnificent. Uh, uh, group of caves which uh, which has this representation and if you observe this representation you will see the uh, you will see an ease of life you will see an ease of interaction between men and women a naturalness which is very difficult to find anywhere in the world today this is the way human beings were perhaps meant to be easy, natural, and unafraid. You see these women pulling at the sashes uh, of his uh, dhoti playfully. And besides human beings, you have uh, made on uh, the uh, temple walls, the, all the animals and living beings which you see in the world uh, around us. You see here uh, at the uh, Chinakeshwara temple at Belur, you see elephants, you see animals, you see horse riders, you see the activity of life as you would recognize it in the world around. 
And as you see here on the walls of uh, Khajuraho, you see also deities, you see also mythical creatures, and you see couples, amorous couples. So this is the life of the world in every form that uh, you see around you in the world, which is presented here in the outer walls of the edifice. And also in the outer uh, railings and walls is this uh, marvelous uh, image, which is uh, very common in the earliest uh, stupa railings. There is this uh, unending vine of life, which uh, moves pulsatingly through the railings and brings to us all the forms of the world brings to us fruit, it brings to us flowers, it brings to us animals, all that we see around us. And you also see these ganas from whose mouth uh, they are disgorging the vine of life and disgorging the forms of the world. So this is a, uh, this is a depiction of uh, all the maya or mithya of the world being created and continuing and pulsating through our lives, pulsating through the life, uh, through the life of the stupa railings, and uh, all this, this uh, multitude of depictions, and this multitude of the creativity which is behind these uh, uh, forms. All this we see, and all this we know we have to leave behind in our search for that which will be lasting and that which will be true. And in these uh, numerous forms which are made on the stupa railings, you see not only the creatures of the world, but you also see uh, composite creatures, delightful, wonderful uh, creatures. You see here a creature that is partly an elephant, partly a deer, partly a horse, partly a cow, all of them so easily interwoven into each other in the, in the uh, vision presented by this artist. For indeed, for these artists, all these are the same. And all these are part of the Maya of the world, whether we actually see them with our physical eyes in the world or we see them with the inner eye. But this is all the Maya that we have in the world. And also on these uh, stupa railings and uh, later uh, temples, and here we see from uh, the first century, uh, second century BCE, a Purnagata, a vase of plenty, a beautiful depiction of. Uh, of the Maya of the world coming forth, rising out the profusion of uh, the Maya of the world, rising out of a Purnaghata, a vase of plenty. Now, many of the early caves, for instance, uh, the Buddhist caves at Bhaja, uh, had uh, even the uh, pillars which were made in the cave rising out of Purnaghatas, as all must come out of Purnaghatas, the vases of plenty. And uh, in fact, in early depictions, the Purnaghatas were also made in, in such a way they, they uh, were combined with the figure of a woman, for, uh, for a woman was also presented as a Purnaghata, in those uh, beautiful images, for instance, uh, uh, as seen at uh, Abhravati. And these Purna Ghatas, out of which uh, rise uh, uh, the pillars, is a theme which continued and spread to the whole of Asia. As a matter of fact, uh, even today, when I'm traveling and documenting art in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, I see Purna Ghatas with uh, pillars rising out of them, not only in religious edifices, but even sometimes 
uh, on the streets with street lamps rising out of a Purnakata. And as we have gone around the stupa railing, or we have gone around uh, the temple walls, we then come to the uh, entrance, the important uh, threshold, where we'll, we will leave behind the distractions of the world in our journey to seek the truth. And here at the threshold, here at the gateway, are made yakshas or yakshis. The word uh, yaksh comes from the root of uh, yagna, which means a ritual offering. And indeed, we pay our respects to the yakshi or the yaksh as we proceed on this journey. They are made uh, as uh, the symbols of profusion, the symbols of fertility of the world. It is, it, they, are, they are made, the uh, yakshi will uh, be seen touching the branch of a tree and the tree will burst into uh, uh, flowers and fruit for such is the power of maya. In fact, uh, the yakshi in, uh, in Indian art and uh, may also be termed as maya the uh, force of the creative abundance of nature. And here you see a, a yakshi at the gateway of the uh, Vedika, of the Bharhut uh, Stupa railing, uh, originally from uh, Central, Asia, uh, Central India, and is now kept in the uh, Indian Museum in Kolkata. And you will see how marvelously her leg is intertwined with the tree for uh, the, uh, the, the unity of all that there is, all the living forms of the world, all the jiva of the world is so beautifully expressed. There is no distinction between uh, the forms of the trees and the forms of human beings. And so this is Maya before us. Maya, who we must leave behind, but such is the power of Maya that we must bow up heads before her, before we proceed on the journey. And here we see another representation of uh, Maya, of uh, the Yakshi. And this is uh, on the uh, Torana, the gateway of the uh, Sanchi Stupa of uh, the first century CE. And again, it is a convincing depiction of the exuberant uh, wealth of nature, the, uh, the great force of nature with which uh, the forms of the world are created around us. And in the meantime, uh, in the uh, Hindu tradition, we see the uh, presentation of the, uh, the phallic uh, Shivalinga which is uh, you, you have the yoni made below, uh, the female uh, yoni, and above that, you, rising out of it, you see the uh, linga. And this is, uh, this is a great uh, philosophic symbol which combines the, the yakshi at the gateway, it combines the fruitful abundance of nature with the depiction of the formless eternal in one uh, symbol. And this is the marvelous symbol of the uh, phallic uh, Shivalinga in the Yoni. Here we have this uh, beautiful image uh, of the 12th century in the National Museum of uh, Bangladesh from uh, a Buddhist uh, site uh, next to uh, Dhaka. It is an image inscribed uh, Maya. And it depicts uh, the, uh, the yoni 
and the Shivalinga and rising out of it, Maya herself. And we are also reminded that in early times, there was uh, no conflict at all uh, between uh, the people of the different uh, philosophic paths in India. As a matter of fact, as we are aware today, uh, every single family that we know about from ancient India had within it somebody who was worshipping uh, perhaps a Hindu deity, somebody who was worshipping a Buddha, somebody who was worshipping a Jaina, Tirthankara. So all these uh, philosophic concepts, and they all coexisted so beautifully as you see in this image here of the Shiva Linga and Maya taken from a Buddhist uh, site in uh, Bangladesh. Of course, Bangladesh area was also one of the, the great uh, Buddhist and Hindu uh, centers. And uh, the, we, we have seen the Yakshis. Excuse me. <clears throat> We've seen the Yakshis presenting before us the, the vigor and the abundance of uh, nature. And uh, the earliest uh, such image, which becomes uh, crystallized in its iconography, Lakshmi and of uh, Saraswati. And the earliest uh, Lakshmis that we see are Gaja Lakshmi. Lakshmi with uh, elephants that pour water upon her. And these are very commonly seen uh, in the uh, early uh, uh, stupa railings, as you see here from the second century BCE, <clears throat> from the Harhut uh, stupa railing preserved in uh, Kolkata in the Indian Museum. And here you see another uh, beautiful uh, Gajalakshmi uh, from the uh, uh, stupa, the, the great stupa at uh, Sanchi. And uh, as you see, the elephants are pouring water upon her and she represents this uh, great abundance, this great uh, wealth of nature. Of course, uh, as a uh, uh, as time evolves and changes, uh, she has become today for, in the Indian imagination as the uh, deity of uh, financial success because earlier it was the wealth of nature which has now become uh, wealth itself. And the earliest image that we have of uh, Saraswati also of the second century BCE is again from the uh, Bharhut uh, Stupa really. And uh, Saraswati is the uh, Yakshi who presents the, uh, the finer aspects of the Maya of life around us. She represents music, she represents creativity, she represents knowledge, she represents the, the finest of all the aspects of life. But of course, whether it is the wealth of nature presented by uh, uh, Lakshmi, or it is the wealth of the mind and the heart creativity presented by Saraswati, these are all to be left behind as we must one day proceed or hope to proceed towards an understanding of that which is lasting and beyond all this that we see around us. And uh, Saraswati continues to be uh, the most popular deity, for instance, of uh, Japan. Uh, other countries too. In fact, uh, in, uh, in the USA, if you go to Washington, D.C., and you go to the uh, embassy of uh, Indonesia, you will find uh, a big statue of uh, Saraswati right in front as you approach the embassy. Uh, here in Japan, 
there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of temples to Saraswati. Saraswati is the most uh, revered deity after uh, Lord Buddha in uh, Japan. Scores of these temples to her are in uh, Tokyo itself. So, uh, and it is to be observed that uh, while uh, in India we now worship Saraswati in this form, with the veena, with the musical instrument representing creativity, we often lose sight of the fact that the uh, original uh, Saraswati was a personification of the great river by that name. Now, the Japanese have not forgotten that. In fact, half the temples to Saraswati present her with the Veena, and another half of the temples of uh, Saraswati present her as water, as the abundant source of fertility. So the Japanese have in many ways preserved ancient culture very beautifully. Uh, you would also be happy to know that uh, the Japanese continue to worship uh, all the uh, uh, Indian deities, including Indra and Brahma and Shiva and Vishnu and Lakshmi and uh, uh, so many others. Now, beyond the uh, making of uh, yakshis and beyond the making of uh, uh, Lakshmi and uh, Saraswati, the abundance of the natural order, the uh, uh, fertility of the natural order uh, began to be presented in all the Indian temples in the form of the personifications of rivers. Here in this uh, sixth century image, you see an image of uh, Ganga, that is the larger of the two images. The smaller one is uh, Riksha Devi. So the temples began to present the uh, three great rivers which watered the plains of uh, northern India. So it is uh, Ganga, Yamuna, and uh, Saraswati, who again representing the fruitful abundance of nature, the, the water that uh, helps to create the life of the world as we know it around us began to be presented in uh, the outer areas of all the temples. Now, along with the making of uh, the uh, yakshis, presenting this uh, fruitful abundance, uh, th there was also the making which came about of uh, loving couples, Mithunas, as we see here in this marvelous image of the Karle Buddhist caves of the first, second century BCE. And I would like you to observe this image because I believe this may be the finest uh, sculpture of humankind. What a marvelous depiction. On the one hand, it is uh, so dignified. You look at the peaceful expressions upon the face of both the yaksha and the yakshi, this loving couple. And at the same time, their forms so convincingly depict the fruitful abundance of nature, the power that surges through the natural order, creating all the forms of the world, the creativity, this blossoming of creativity is so completely and so well expressed in these bodily forms and simultaneously the dignity of it all. What a beautiful image. Of course, as uh, time progressed uh, at this stage, it was just uh, the yaksha and the yakshi uh, standing close to each other which was enough to suggest the completeness of the natural order. In time to come, 
the representations became more and more explicit. And uh, in much later times, for instance, you see by the uh, 10th century at Khajuraho, they became very explicit depictions of the coming together of the Yaksha and the Yakshi. But this is among the earliest and uh, most, uh, most beautiful and dignified and wondrous depictions of the Mitrana. Karli Buddhist caves are about halfway on the highway from uh, Mumbai to Pune. And you uh, must avail of a, an opportunity if you get to visit them. Now we come to uh, the depiction of the, uh, of the harmony of the natural order, the harmony of the world around us, the harmony of the universe, the, the peace, the uh, justice, the uh, harmonic nature, the preservation of the natural order. And this is personified in Vishnu. And uh, as you are aware, you see here in this uh, early image of the uh, Kushana period. As we are aware, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, avatara or the birth of uh, Lord Vishnu as Rama uh, also represents the uh, balance and justice and uh, uh, just rule of uh, a king and therefore Rama continues to be worshipped across Asia even in uh, Buddhist countries of Asia like uh, Thailand the king is still till today called Rama so this is uh, this is the preservation of the natural order the uh, justice and peace and harmony of the natural order personified uh, in uh, Vishnu. And the potential of uh, enlightenment which is within us, that enlightenment with which we may be able to ourselves uh, see the truth, know the truth, is personified in Buddhas. And as you see here in an early image of the Pushana period, uh, this is uh, this is uh, the Buddha, a school of thought which uh, spread from India and practically became uh, the most important uh, uh, religion in the whole of Asia. So here we have a Buddha of the Koshana period. And um, the personification of the energy within us with which we would fight the demons of our ignorance. For the only demons in Indic thought are the demons of uh, ignorance. And this energy which we have within us, this courage which we have within us is so beautifully uh, personified in uh, Durga. And here we see her as Mahisha Sudmartini. Uh, Durga, as she destroys the buffalo demon of uh, ignorance. And this is the masterpiece uh, depiction, the finest depiction of uh, Mahisha Sudmartini, which is at uh, uh, Mabalapuram of the uh, 8th century. Another very beautiful depiction of uh, Mahisha Surmardini is to be found at uh, Patadakal of about the same uh, period. And I should mention that uh, she is a great favorite of uh, the Indian artist. And here you see her with a back arched as she uh, draws, uh, she pulls upon her bow to let loose an arrow at the uh, Mahisha, the buffalo demon of, uh, of ignorance inside us. And you see the uh, buffalo demon and uh, 
uh, his other associates uh, all leaning back in fear as she advances. Beautiful composition. And uh, the self-assured ganas of uh, Durga's army that you see below on the left are unforgettable. Mahisha Surbandani. Now, perhaps one of the most uh, beautiful uh, personifications in uh, the Indic faiths is that of uh, Krishna. The word Krishna comes from the root of the word Akarshan, which means attraction. And uh, the Indian philosophy does not shy away from the fact that human beings have inside us the potential of much excite, uh, much attraction. There is much in the world which uh, attracts us. And we are attracted to our wives, we are attracted to our husbands, we are attracted to our children, we are attracted to so many things. So our attraction itself is personified in the beautiful image of uh, Krishna that you see here uh, as Vinukopala, uh, Lord Krishna playing uh, the flute. So instead of uh, shying away from uh, the attraction that we feel, we are directed, our attraction is directed towards the divine. We are made to see how all that there is, including our attraction, is after all divine. And we are therefore always attracted to the divine. I might mention that uh, uh, Krishna continues to be a very popular deity in uh, many places. In fact, uh, we find uh, images of uh, Krishna. We discovered, Sujata and I, my associate, we discovered an image of uh, Krishna, a Vinu Gopala, in a 8th century uh, very large brass lamp at uh, the Todaiji temple at Nara. And we found that even till today, contemporary images of uh, Vinu Gopala are popular in Japan. And uh, now, some of our greatest of attractions is towards uh, our children. So Krishna is also presented to us in the form of baby Krishna, since we are so fond of our children. And this leads to some of the most exquisite uh, Indian art, as you see here, uh, a uh, close view from uh, a miniature painting of the Kangra school in uh, Himachal Pradesh. And we see here uh, Krishna uh, uh, pretending to be sorry. We see baby Krishna with his mother and he's uh, rubbing his eyes. It's very clear the artists are extremely good. It is very clear that this child is not really sorry. He's pretending to be sorry. And these are the image, images which pull at our heartstrings and bring out the emotional best in us, bring out the warmth in us, bring out the affection, bring out the love in us. And all of it directed towards the divine through Krishna. A marvelous uh, philosophic uh, concept. And uh, the most ascetic of uh, traditions is that of the Jainas. Uh, they have their personification of uh, the Jinnas or the Thankaras. Jinnah means a victor, victor over the fear of death itself. Since uh, life is the final attraction and uh, we have to give up all our attractions to the material world. The jinnas present us the final victory, the conquest over the fear of death itself. And here we see uh, Kumateshwara, 
a Jinnah, a Tirthankara of the Jain tradition. And he is believed to have meditated in a standing position for so long that uh, vines and creepers grew around his uh, legs and arms. And with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I would be very happy to uh, answer questions. I was just wondering uh, how fascinating way that uh, Professor Ji explained the, the similarity between the Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. And what comes to my mind is uh, in Hinduism, we stress the eternity, the infinite uh, Ishwara. But in Buddhism, what is stressed is the Shunyata. So basically, even though we are talking about the same thing, is that Ishava Simidam Sarvam, the entire creation is permeated through divinity, everything is God. At the end, uh, recognizing that most of this, all the creation is a Maya, what is stressed in Buddhism is Shunyata Karam, very fascinating way of uh, describing the similarity of the same thought process expressed in different ways, in different stream, faith traditions arising from the same Indian subcontinent. So I just want to see what Bhuma's uh, response to that is. Yes, uh, Dr. Shahani, you have put it so well yourself. On the one hand, we are talking about uh, the divinity of all that there is. On the other hand, we are talking about uh, the emptiness of the uh, Maya as we see around us. So, as you have put it so well, we are actually talking about the same thing. And we are talking about it in different ways. In fact, there are so many different ways of talking about the same great truth, the same great Upanishadic truth. And, uh, and the, whole, the whole history of philosophy and the rich history of philosophy in so many ways, whether it is uh, the Bhakti movement, whether it is, uh, and we are going to be talking about some of these things in the, the course of uh, the next few talks also. And uh, it, is, it is really quite wonderful how, with how much energy, different uh, ways are found to explain and to look at the same great truth. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, to me, it appears Hinduism mostly talks about glass half full, and uh, Buddhism is talking about glasses half empty. <laughs> but it's Shunita versus, you know, everything is God. It is the same thing. It is the, the concept that uh, the world as we perceive it is samsara and it is uh, illusory and uh, actually we need to recognize and to come to know and, uh, that it is all divine there is nothing except that which is divine and for this we have to leave behind all the distractions that they are around there are so many different ways, so many different forms of yoga. Bhakti yoga, Gyan yoga, Raj yoga, Karma yoga. So many different ways are found to help us on this path of, uh, of uh, escape from all this uh, which uh, obsesses us on a daily basis. To head towards an understanding of that which is expected to be nirgun or Arupa, or Shunyata. Thank you. If I may interject, Bhimaji, is uh, um, the reason I practice and uh, Hinduism uh, is because of the positive feeling that leaves behind. For example, Shankaraja, they're talking about Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mithya. Okay? And, and the, at the end he says, uh, uh, the jiva and Brahma is the same. So basically, it ends you in a very positive tone at the very end. Jivo Brahma even apara. So that is the way I like ending in the positive tone than ending in the form of shunyata, recognizing that what is expressed 
creation is maybe shunya. But since we are identical to the creator itself, you end up in a very positive feelings personally. So, my bias. <laughs> yes, yes. No, you, you are very right. And the whole of Indian philosophy, all of it, uh, including uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism, uh, are really talking about the, uh, the unity of all that there is. And uh, to recognize this unity means uh, uh, a shunita of all the disturbances. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it is only the disturbances which uh, we must leave behind. And indeed, uh, ever since the writing of the Upanishads in the 8th, 9th century BCE, mm -hmm. as early as that, these thoughts were so beautifully formulated, these thoughts which you have uh, quoted just now and expressed so well uh, the, the oneness of it all and the fact that uh, for each person to recognize that uh, he is himself part of the divine, he is himself divine. As a matter of fact, as we were uh, talking about in the talk uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, the deities that are presented are are somewhat like uh, mirrors for us to see the, mm -hmm. the great beauty, the grace, the compassion, the kindness, the wisdom which is inside us. So they are only personifications of that which is within us. We look upon them to awaken that same within us until that will fill us completely. And at that point, you have become the deity. Mm -hmm. It is so beautiful. It is so positive as that. And I completely understand and appreciate what you mean that, uh, in fact, Indian thought is, uh, is so positive. Mm -hmm. It is not, uh, it's not an escape from anything. It is not uh, running away from anything, but it is helping us to recognize that we are ourselves truly beautiful. Mm -hmm. I we find it since uh, being a specialist in children's diseases, when we teach that children at a younger age, they grow up to be following those universal values instead of saying, don't do. And that's the way we have been always teaching our students. So we feel really good about it. Thank you. I'm so glad you like that. Thank you. Binoyji, this is Madhavi. I'm uh, talking from California. Just uh, wanted to acknowledge how beautiful both your lectures were. Uh, totally fascinating. And uh, my question uh, is, I, I was really intrigued by the, uh, to know about the uh, worship or the presence of the Hindu deities in Japan. Um, I was wondering whether the new generation is also in tune uh, with understanding the significance of these deities, or is it merely a historical representation there? Hmm. You would be happy to know that uh, uh, the Hindu deities continue to be very actively worshipped in all the temples, all the Buddhist temples of Japan. In fact, uh, uh, the Sanskrit alphabet is present in the shrine of practically every home in Japan. And uh, next Sunday, I'll be showing you a film about this and taking you straight into the heart of the matter. I think you will enjoy it very much. Thank oh, you. That's wonderful. Thank you. I hear the explanation of Jan term, you, Jan Tirthankar, you said, who has got the victory over fear of death. I had an earlier impression that it uh, comes from the knowledge that, you know, the Jan is someone who is, you know, uh, Gyan. <laughs> it comes from a Gyan tradition. So am I wrong? So if you can explain, that will be good. Uh, Jina means uh, victor, and uh, you are right in understanding that uh, it is 
the Gyan tradition because uh, the victory over the fear of death is after all through true knowledge. The attraction of the world around us, the attraction of life itself, the attraction to all the fruits of life is all part of our ignorance. And therefore the conquest uh, of our desires, the conquest of uh, finally even the fear of death is the victory of uh, Gyan and it is the victory of the Jinnah, the conqueror. Thank you. And uh, I'm reminded that you had, uh, you had spoken about an article of mine which uh, last Sunday, which I have found. And I yeah. think uh, tomorrow I should be able to send it to you. Thank you. Which is to do with uh, how all these marvelous uh, uh, things that we spoke about in today's talk were in fact transported to Europe. And these concepts are to be found in uh, the early churches of, uh, of uh, Spain, Italy, Portugal. So I'll, I'll send the, I'll be sending it tomorrow, then you can pass it on to the others too. Thank you. And my second question, or it's more like, you know, something I learned now is today uh, is, you know, the Shiva is formless Linga. And then there's a connection to the Stupa, which is also formless. That's how they were making the domes. And uh, it, it seems to me that, you know, dome, is a personification of, again, kind of the same formless or near good form of, uh, you know, representation of God. And then even in Islam, they're making domes, you see. That. So is there a link between, you know, it's like a growth slowly from history over time? Right. Now, first of all, the first thing that you mentioned was the formless uh, linga. And here I must mention to you that uh, the greatest uh, formless linga of uh, Tamil Nadu, as I showed you, survives in the uh, Chidambaram temple. But in fact, in days gone by, and days gone by were more philosophic than today, uh, there were many such representations. In fact, uh, friends of mine who have been uh, uh, district uh, magistrates or district collectors in Tamil Nadu in the beginning of their careers had seen uh, temples which had uh, uh, formless uh, depictions in their uh, sanctum sanctorum. But as time has progressed, people have become more and more obsessed with forms. So most of these uh, shrines have now been occupied with uh, formful deities. And uh, yes, in all the uh, Indic uh, faiths, the final journey is always towards understanding of the Nirgun. Understanding of that which is beyond it all. Understanding of that which in fact creates all the pain of the world all our attractions. And uh, so I can speak uh, for the Indic faiths. The other faiths which you mentioned, I'm not so sure about their basis, but, uh, but these, uh, to begin with, were all about presenting something which was not very formful, so that when you sit down to meditate, you are not distracted. You do not look there and immediately start thinking about your wife or your husband or your child. So therefore, as formless as possible. One question is about Yakshan Yakshini. I mean, the, my first introduction was when I saw it in the Reserve Bank of India building. I think that's where they're standing there, huge uh, statues of Yakshan Yakshini protecting Kubeh's, you know, representing, you know, Kubeh. Reserve Bank of India as, you know, Kubeh's uh, institution or something. So, and why do we see Yakshan Yakshini only as, you know, kind of a gatekeeper or sculptures, etc.? Right. Yes. 
these came up uh, at the very important uh, point, very important place, which is the threshold where you are leaving behind the concerns of the material world, where you are leaving behind all uh, the wealth of nature, and you are entering through the gateway as you wish to proceed towards the knowledge of the Nirkun or the Arupa. So at that point, finally, is the personification of the power of uh, Maya. And that is where they come, the Yaksha, the Yakshi. And, uh, and as their name suggests, they are something to be uh, ritually adored, something before which you would give a ritual offering. And therefore, you bow your head. You recognize the power of Maya upon your life. It is not so easy to give it all up. Even if intellectually you understand that there may be something which is beyond. And that which is only passing shadows. That which may last in this world for only 60, 70, 80, 100 years is after all not the truth. There has to be something beyond. Even if you understand all this intellectually, it is very difficult to get out of the power of uh, Maya. So you have the Yaksha and Yaksha. You bow your head. You recognize the power of the Yaksha, the Yaksha. But then, if you are on the journey, you leave them behind at the gateway. Then you go in. So therefore, that is why they are on the gateway. Thank you. Yes, uh, Namaste, Professor. Uh, I just wanted to know that you know, as you talked about how there was so much, uh, there was so much fluidity earlier in belief in the sense if you wanted to follow Buddha, people would just do it, right? But now, I recently I saw this news that uh, some tribal groups in India were scared that they didn't want it to be part of, like they didn't want it to come under the section of Hindu, like as like how Sikhism and Buddhism comes. But so like, I just want to know what has changed over last, like, you know, like, what has changed over the years that people today are so rigid about, like these identities, but not so much about like the, their belief or like the things that they believe in. I don't know if that's like, that's a, like, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's it. Yes. Indeed, the whole world has changed, has it not? The world is, uh, uh, the whole world has become uh, much more rigid than it used to be. The ancient times were a much more uh, philosophic time. There was much more uh, inward looking and uh, deep philosophic journey. The recognition of the fact that the individual must make his own journey and the recognition of the fact that uh, the individual is all that is important. As a matter of fact, uh, as we were talking a little bit about during uh, last Sunday's talk, the early uh, temples and caves of all the traditions, in fact, were very small. As I had mentioned, sometimes outcrops of rock were left standing outside of the Buddhist caves so that you could not even see the uh, Buddhist cave from uh, outside really until you came right up to it. So there was no there was no advertising there was not there was no calling upon people to come or to join but uh, knowledge is something which uh, the seeker, has to seek for himself and then he will gain knowledge if he has a deep desire to gain knowledge. And the knowledge is to be found within, not from outside sources. So that is all I can say that uh, the entire world uh, is a little less philosophic now than it used to be. Thank you. Humility, if I may mention, was uh, the key to uh, uh, evolution 
and rising and understanding and depth and growing. So there was constantly the search for humility. Uh, the, as I had mentioned in uh, last Sunday's talk, uh, kings did not, there was a time when even kings did not mention their own names uh, in their inscriptions. They just wrote Devanam Pia Piyadasi without writing a name. And as I may have mentioned, even the king in Sri Lanka who was following the Indian tradition. Uh, did not write his name. We don't know his name till today. He just wrote uh, Devanam Pia Pia Tissa. And uh, as I may have mentioned, to the northwest of India, uh, such an inscription also exists of the 3rd century BC in the language of Aramaic, which uh, Jesus Christ would speak uh, three centuries after that inscription. Uh, even kings had their uh, homes made only out of ephemeral materials, which would not last because the personality was not important. What was important was humility. What was important was the losing of the ego. And that was the essence of life. That was the higher purpose of life, to be able to realize that I am nothing at all. Thank you. And for Dr. Shahani, I would say that uh, I agree with him that in being nothing at all, one rises to become everything that there is. Exactly. Such is a marvelous philosophy. I have to say that I am a bit doubtful about the nothing at all component because of my own experience. The most connected, the moment when I first felt connected universally came during a walk in the woods when as a biologist, I was contemplating genes in a very loose way. And it came to my awareness that the trees around me and I share many genes. The trees are very different, but we have a great deal in common at the same time. And it was that scientific thought that somehow transformed into a sense of connectedness, a sense of unity with all that there is out into the universe. And that could not, in my awareness, be described as a, as a sense of being nothing. That was an experience of being a part of everything. And to me, that language is significantly different. Yes, and yet they are also deeply interconnected by being a part of everything, by being everything yourself. You are in fact no longer just and only you. You are everything. Thank you. And it's so beautiful. I can imagine your, uh, your walk in the woods. I can imagine how beautiful it is. And such moments, uh, such moments are uh, in the philosophy of aesthetics. Uh, such moments of revelation, such moments where you are seeing the grace which underlies all that there is. And such moments are akin to Brahmanan or the final bliss you may wish for of salvation itself. Binoyji, this is Madhavi again. Um, I just um, had a question out of the comments that the earlier um, uh, person asked of you and uh, you, your remarks actually about how the olden times, the kings didn't even put their names uh, on uh, their works. My question is in today's world, is it really possible 
to do such a thing, uh, there is so much risk of intellectual theft all the time. Uh, even on your slides, I can see the copyright of your photos, you know. So, I mean, this, this is the, how the present times are. Is it really possible to carry on any of our work without putting our names on it? Uh, not so much um, about humility. In fact, I was showing one of my, um, my one of my books with some photographs to one of my patients, and she's a writer author herself. And she pointed out that please put a copyright mark on this, otherwise your pictures and your writings are going to be stolen. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, thank you so much for pointing out uh, uh, my own uh, failing, for it is my failing. And uh, this is, uh, yes, this is what we have to, we have to look for a change. We have to gradually look for a change in all that there is around us. There has to be, there has to be a re-education. There has to be an understanding of what is the true source of happiness and how uh, all happiness is very ethically based. And unfortunately, we are living in a world where there has been a propagation of the fact that uh, the worldly wise are very sensible. And uh, the, in fact, uh, the ethical standards is truly what is important. There has to be a recognition of the fact that uh, uh, a truly ethical life can in fact also be a happy life. In fact, it can even be a materially prosperous life. As a matter of fact, complete following of ethics may mean even more prosperity. So there has to be somewhere a re-education. There has to be an understanding of what is the science of life. And I believe it would be important uh, for this to start happening soon because uh, we do seem to be in the process of destroying the world by our uh, unbridled greed, avarice, by our great uh, uh, hunger for uh, more and more uh, material goods. We, I don't know how many of us are aware uh, of where we are just now, what is happening to the world, whether it is the forest fires, uh, in California and other states in the USA, whether it is floods in India, whether it is huge disasters in China, whether it is forest fires in uh, Australia, whether it is uh, the Amazon, which is being ruined, of Amazon forests, I mean. Somewhere it is about time to realize that uh, we are going a little off the path. We're going off the path of the recognition of the unity of all that there is. We're going off the path of dharma, of ethics, of living in the responsibility of which we have towards all that there is around us, every single jiva or being, and not just jiva or being, but all that there is. So it is about time that... Uh, uh, we need to focus again upon what makes us happy. Because if we don't, uh, things have gone so far that I don't think, uh, I don't think world leaders also are talking about it because they don't want to talk about it. But things have gone pretty far, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. I have a simple question. What's the timing of uh, Buddhism and Hinduism because uh, I was watching a video actually I have it on this thing this is about this is from Bhante Vimakriti Gunsari yeah, he's a Buddhist monk current time 
but he says, oh, Hinduism was created 1300 years after Buddhism. So it's uh, kind of, you know, which is goes totally against my any, you know, uh, sense of knowledge. So I was just uh, wondering, what's the, when did the Hinduism start? Um, we don't know that, but when did the Buddhism start at least? Now, the first thing I'd like you to uh, observe is that uh, there was uh, uh, no divided religions in ancient India, uh, such as Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, etc. As I have, uh, as I do not tire uh, in pointing out, if you look at the main source of history that we have of ancient India, and this is a uh, the source of 99% uh, of all the history that we know. It is the inscriptions on monuments. And the inscriptions on monuments make it completely clear that every single family that we know about in ancient India, there was somebody worshipping a Hindu deity, somebody worshipping a Buddhist deity, or somebody worshipping a Jaina deity. So the idea of these being separated religions is the first thing that... Uh, we have to dispel. It is something that was created by the uh, colonial rulers and it's a colonial construct which we need to put behind. Now, talking about uh, timelines, the uh, earliest uh, knowledge that we have uh, about uh, the Indian uh, subcontinent goes back to what is uh, termed the Indus Valley Civilization though it is uh, found today to be much more widespread than just the valley of uh, the Indus River, but the term still continues to be used. Now, in that, we begin to notice the roots of the philosophic thinking which we are talking about. We have uh, representations already of yoga, and yoga is the basis of uh, whether it is Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, the Indic uh, ways of, uh, of uh, understanding of uh, what is true and divinity and the, the path towards uh, salvation is through yoga. We have uh, the beginnings of uh, deities, the way they later came to be made in Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism. So such things we already see in the in this valley civilization. So here we are talking about uh, you know, we are talking about at least uh, four thousand years ago. Then by the eighth or ninth century BCE, we have the formulation of uh, the Upanishads, and these Upanishads are obviously formulating thoughts which must have already been there for a long time because they reach us in the early Upanishads as fully formulated, very wonderfully uh, expressive thoughts. And here is where the concept of uh, the uh, oneness of all that there is, the oneness of all the beings that there is, the oneness of myself with the greater one, these are expressed in a fully clear and expressive way. 8th, 9th century BC is when we, we find these. Now, uh, we come further up and uh, by about the, well, you have stupas of the Ajivikas that seem to go back to the 8th or 10th century BCE. And we have uh, 6th, 7th century, we start having uh, uh, people who are uh, great teachers for following uh, in this uh, uh, philosophic path, formulating uh, religions such as Buddhism and Jainism, etc. So that is the timeline that you have. Now, you have the earliest uh, thoughts already present in the Indus Valley civilization, uh, you know, more than 4,000 years ago. And these are the later uh, manifestations, as I pointed out. 
Thank you. If I, if I might continue on that discussion briefly, Arun, won't take more yes. than a couple of minutes. I think it's important to understand the uh, uh, naming of the faith traditions that we had in the past. According to the book, which I'll bring it to you next time, Sunday when I come to the temple, the timing of the Mahabharata war. It is established with several articles, including PhD thesis, that it came around 31, 37 BC. And when you're talking about that time, and you refer to Gita's description with 700 verses, he describes the faith tradition that we practice now as Sanatana Dharma, the eternal lifestyle of righteous living. So the name of Hinduism came much later. So from that point of view, you know how old our tradition is. And as uh, Professor described beautifully, it's not simply in Indus Valley civilization. It started with Saraswati River and all the way to include quite a bit of uh, Asian continent as well. So it's important to his, know historically the, the facts. And as early as 540 BC, we had a university called Takshashila, where the people from various different parts of the world were coming to learn various sciences uh, and faith traditions. So when we know that history, the Gautam Buddha, which is included in our avatars too, Matsya, Kurma, Varava, Narasimha, Parshuram, Rama, Krishna, and we, then we call it Gautam Buddha in many traditions instead of Balrama. So we have to remember that we accept the enlightened people as a part of divine incarnations as well. So that gives you some timeline, but when we meet in person, I'll give this book for you. Thank you. In fact, uh, not only is the Takshi Shila University so important, Nalanda. but uh, there was a consortium of universities. Yep. Of course, there is, as you said, Nalanda, there is, after that, there was Vikram Shila, yep. there was the uh, Baharpur uh, University in what is Bangladesh now. Then there was uh, great universities at Indonesia. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, they were all interconnected. In fact, uh, Atisha is one of the known instances mm -hmm. of somebody who studied at the Nananda University, then went for his higher studies to Indonesia, to the university there, and then came back and became a great teacher at the Vikramshila University before he was called up to uh, teach and spread, uh, uh, create a school of Buddhism in uh, Tibet. Mm -hmm. So truly, it's quite remarkable. In fact, uh, you were able to, we talk about it sometime, but you were able to trace the uh, uh, concepts of universal knowledge and scientific thought at these great uh, universities, concepts which later traveled uh, far and wide and perhaps even to Europe. But uh, they are these marvelous concepts. And as you have pointed out, uh, and as I was also talking about uh, the uh, thoughts of uh, the uh, great Indian philosophy are very, very deeply rooted. So there is, in fact, uh, uh, besides the divisions of religions, which were created by, the, by colonial uh, historians, as you have pointed out, these are very, very deep roots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor Bell. Well, great pleasure. Thank you all very much. See you next Sunday then.